Good morning, I'm Mohini Naidu, Investment Analyst at Ned Group Investments, and it is my pleasure today to welcome Stephen Romick of FPA, Co-Portfolio Manager of the Ned Group Investments Global Flexible Fund. Steve will be talking to us today about recent fund performance, some of the drivers of those performance, and also take a look at recent developments in China and how that impacts FPA's investment thesis and portfolio positioning. Without further ado, I now welcome Steve. Over to you. Thank you very, very much, Mahini. I appreciate it. Thank you, Ned Group, for, for taking the time uh, to, to always you know, coordinate these calls for us. And we thank all of you on the, who are listening to this as we sit and, and, and speak to the topic today, which is uh, more of the same with respect to the Ned Group Investments Global Flexible Fund. We, we, we say more of the same because the world really hasn't changed that much. I mean, sadly, you know, the world is not out of COVID yet, and I hope everybody's faring relatively well you know, as we continue to, to move through this uh, you know, course of, of, of this um, pandemic. If you turn to page two, just to highlight what the objective is in the fund as we continue to address you know, our targets of, of equity rates of return, you know, over the long term, with less risk than the that the capital markets have, you know, as we really seek to avoid permanent impairments of capital, this portfolio is really geared to be to be fully flexible. With this idea of being taken advantage to take advantage of of the debt markets when opportunities are thrown are being thrown our way as well, we just haven't seen a lot of that in the recent couple of years, given you know the low rates and the low rates are really the biggest driver of why I say more of the same. The world has not changed. That much. I mean, the markets continue to remain elevated, rates remain low, and how you know, we will deal with and what level of inflation there will be and how the markets will react to that will be will be an imperative, you know, uh, for as far as the markets are concerned and understanding that as as uh, as the you know future quarters unfold. If you look turn to the portfolio review and jump to page four, the asset composition, you know, within the portfolio today remains. Um, above 70% for equities, but that's down from where we were in the second quarter as we've taken some profits in various securities as the markets continued you know, to be strong. Still you know, somewhat higher than a year ago, but sitting between where we were a you know, year ago, Q3, but as I said, below where we peaked in, in Q2. And again, highlighting the point that I just made a moment ago, the bond exposure is, is down dramatically from where it was a year ago, and it wasn't that high a year ago at 3%. So the future hopefully will 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 offer more opportunities in the debt markets, but it's pretty hard to you know take you know our collective capital, ours and years, and put it into bonds where the yields are so terribly terribly low, with rates at you know still bumping around in a thousand year lows, with inflation that finally is beginning to rear its head around the globe, and you know, there's some question as to what the level of defaults might be in the future. So until we can get that equity rate of return in the debt markets, we won't be we won't be committing capital there. So cash remains, you know, somewhat, you know, on the high side in the high 20s, you know, today. And again, waiting for more opportunity in the debt markets, which may or may not come. And of course, as we continue to to work through the equity markets, if you look at the asset allocation slide on page five, it breaks it down a little bit, you know, further as you look into different on the left hand side into different uh, industry groups and the right hand side into different regions. The, the communication services, which is a fairly broad, you know, catch all continues to be the largest, you know, largest you know, sector, you know, followed by, you know, closely by financials. If you as you turn to page page six, the, we don't just think about where the the equities are based, we think where the revenues are coming from. So if you look at the country of domicile, although most might be in North America, 66% of the equity book, it's only 42%, less than half of the revenues are really coming from the United States. And you look, and we live in this world where it's a so much of a winner take all or winner take most businesses. And these businesses can be, you know, global, you know, global in nature. So just because we own, you know, Aon that's based in the UK, most of the businesses don't, most of the revenues aren't coming from the UK. Obviously, it's a very, very small, you know, portion of that. In fact, the minority is even in Europe. So the country of domicile is again less important to than where the revenue streams are coming from. And there you see much greater diversity. You see 17% coming from Western Northern Europe and 24% from Asian PAC. 
you look at page seven, speaks to performance. The Ned Group Investments Global Flexible Fund continues to outperform its, its benchmark and has outperformed the, the value index over the last over the last five years, although it was behind the world index, which is, shouldn't be a surprise, you know, given the you know the large you know cash balances that continue to to remain you know in the portfolio. Equity selection has been has been um, has been good, you know, over that over that time frame, which is something very important. And a slide that we have we have shown to you in the past, although we don't have in the deck today. If you turn to uh, slide eight. You know, performance contribution, we really look at the bottom half of this slide and focus on that because there's so much noise as to what happens on a on a quarterly on a quarterly basis. And in fact, you can you look at the detractors on a quarterly basis, the noise that's there for, for three of the five that are that are Chinese based or or, or Chinese centric, I should say that rather than Chinese based. Uh, Alibaba, Process and Baidu, you know, were detractors in the most recent third quarter. The the trailing twelve months are more important. That's where things get you know get smoothed out. So despite but despite the the uh, underperformance the most recent quarter, there's only one of these Chinese centric companies, Alibaba, that is actually a driver of of uh, a, a large one of the top five detractors of performance in the uh, in the trailing twelve months. On the trailing twelve months, on the contributors, it's important to note because we talk about as you look at Alphabet, American International Group, Bayer AIG, Jefferies, Glencore, and Wells Fargo, all five of these companies were purchased when there were when there were in the midst of bad news, when there were shorter periods of underperformance in the market. So we bought Alphabet, you know, a decade ago when people were very fearful about what was going to happen in, with respect to the economy, their advertising centric, you know, business model. AIG, we purchased, you know, originally more than a, you know a decade ago, coming out of the great financial crisis, and today, you know, the, and and even you know coming in a, a year ago, year and a quarter ago, it was viewed quite negatively for their their exposure to the global the global economy, and the stock had collapsed, and obviously as you can see, it's come back. You know, dramatically, Jeffries Financial Group. You know, similarly purchased when people didn't believe in the in the growth dynamic that is, exists in that company, and that stock has dr rallied dramatically from its bottom. Glencore, global commodities company, a business that people were were fearful of, and their coal exposure. Now, if you look at headlines today with coal prices at highs and fears of inflation, and Glencore's stock has performed quite well. Wells Fargo as a business that is has been is, continues to have its it's trivized, and yet it's something that where we sit looking out a couple of years, we'll see how, you know, that that's behind them and how that performs, although that has been a, a contributor over the last 12 months as well. But importantly, all five of these companies showed up as, as significant detractors at a point in time. And so um, it's important for us to always look at the portfolio and say, where is the opportunity? You know, not just in the portfolio, but outside the portfolio where we can go and, you know, add or decrease, you know, positions within the portfolio, and it's driven a lot of times by corporate news. That news flow that is negative that creates the opportunity to to buy something, and corporate news flow that is positive, you know, or you know, or even if it's not news flow, fears of what the news flow might be that creates a certain negativity that allows stock prices to decline, allows us to lean into positions, which leads us to leads us to you know what has been you know characterized as the Chinese miracle as this country. Has, has has offered so much opportunity for investors in recent years and up until this you know, up until this year where there's been a lot of you know bad news you know China in 2019 if you look at the headlines on page uh, on, on on slide um, I think it's slide nine if you turn to that slide you can look at these headlines these are all headlines from China in 2019 where the stock market you know was performing well and the country was viewed as you know, as a uh, as, as 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 I said, the Chinese miracle. Tech valuations were just going through the roof. You know, the, there was so much growth. You know, throughout that economy, and everybody was hammering us. And so, you know, and, and you know, and, and there are different managers and saying, "Why don't you own more China? China's where people should be. There's so much opportunity in China." And it's predicated on you know so much on recent performance at that point in time. But if you jump forward to 2021, the headlines have flipped. There's obviously been you know, tremendous headlines surrounding the different Chinese property developers, including Evergrande and the and the and the 300 billion dollars of debt that they have. There's another you know recent uh, you know company that's likely to default that that's been in the headlines. There's a, there's a number of them. There's a massive amount of leverage throughout the property system, you know, in, in China. And so they believe there's you know there's fears of a, of a financial crisis that's coming. There's there's fears that that the the 
regulatory environments can become much tougher and and the tech stocks have really underperformed as 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 just China really as this headline says from Feb, you know from July you know in the third quarter China stokes regulatory fears and so those fears you know create you know a certain amount of opportunity and for us you know from where we sit you know we 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 sit with the view that that the risk reward of our Chinese holdings is very very balanced in favor you know, you know, of, of, of current valuations. And this is a world where, as, as, I, as I said in my opening remarks, where it's challenging to find high quality growing businesses and pay a reasonable price for them. It's not hard to find high quality growing companies, but to get them at a reasonable valuation is more challenging. And Alibaba, Baidu, Processors, Naspers, I mean, that is, you know, you know, Tencent effectively for a big part of their business, you know, stick out, you know, like Thor thumbs in that, you know, in, that, in, in the world that we live in. You know, that said, we're not oblivious to the fact that that that, you're, that the news flow is negative, but that in, in turn is what leads us, you know, some you know opportunity we think. But we tend to lean into this. We 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 know that there's risk there. We're not going to tell you that the risk doesn't exist. It does. It's real. But that's why. But that risk existed in 2019 in the midst of all of those favorable headlines, which is why we kept our, our position sizes more in in Chinese companies more limited. And the same thing applies today. We're leaning in and buying into weakness, and but we're doing so in not an aggressive fashion. And the, in the total portfolio, that you know, exposure to Chinese companies is still less than five percent of the portfolio. But it's an important, you know, reminder that we should, you know, should deliver to our our investors and our longer investors. Where you know, we'll have greater familiarity with this. But you know, the investment. You know, community. You know, question the the investability of other asset classes and industry groups in which we'd invested in the past. You know, take the Russian equities that we've owned in the past, for example, when there was tremendous bad news, or you know, or or um, the Puerto Rican municipal debt that you know where there is a tremendous you know, bankruptcy risk and and exposure. You know, that we then leaned into in the portfolio, where we believe that the risk reward there was 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 very attractive. Okay. So that is, is, is what we try and do is lead into that kind of weakness as long as we believe that the, you know, the opportunity set you know, warrants it based on, on valuation and the company's business fundamentals warrant it as well. But we're like, I can't sit here and tell you there's no risk, but China there is. But there's risk to everything you know, that, 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 that we invest in. There's risk that you know, companies can always you know, stumble. And so we look at this, you know, we don't own any one company, any one industry or any one country. We own a diverse portfolio of, of businesses around the globe where we believe the risk reward you know, setup is quite, is quite attractive. So those are the uh, our prepared remarks that I'm going to end with. I'm going to turn it over to, to Mohini to, to, I think she has uh, some questions to pose to, to me as well. Thanks very much, Steve. I think those last two slides illustrate how what a screeching halt the world's love affair with China seems to have come to. And it, it's probably more of a fatal attraction now rather than a love affair. But Steve, I think... The well, invest- I didn't say fatal. <laughs> I, that's not a word that I used. <laughs> okay, okay. That's probably overdoing it. But I think, um, I mean, we, we're very familiar with your fundamental bottom-up approach to stock selection and that you tend to shy away from making economic or even business forecasts. But how do you evaluate things like China's social reform program and what some consider to be quite aggressive regulatory changes um, as of this year? How do you factor that into your investment thesis um, and consider it when, when you're making these investments in the portfolio? You know, that's a, it's, a, it's a good question because it's not something you can you can fine tune to a tight number and, and, and get a narrow range of outcomes too. Uh, the, but the, importantly, those regulatory fears and concerns have always been there. They're just in the headlines now. And so we thought about these back in 2019 and knew there was going to be a point in time where that was going to be, you know, fear that was going to be stoked, you know, prospectively. So, what we look to and say is like, will 
Alibaba still be Alibaba or Baidu be a Baidu, you know, in you know ten cent be ten cent, you know, ten years from now, are they still going to? Are their businesses going to be better businesses ten years from now than today? And we believe that they will be with everything that we're seeing. We think that the you know China is trying to crack down on certain things that you know candidly are are inappropriate. And for those of us who have children, there's a lot of a lot of reasonable fears of it stoked. But does needs to be some good governors. You know, on on some of these businesses to make sure that we're delivering something that is is uh, is appropriate to to you know our, the populace. But so those fears are real. But again, will these businesses be better business in ten years? And we think that they will. We think the headlines of of, of two thousand twenty one will look more like two thousand nineteen at some point in the future. When that might be, we know we don't know. Which is why we're not aggressively buying, and which is why we're not letting the position sizes get too large. And so the the regulatory constraints that, that might exist, you know, will we know have yet to be determined. And yet the prices reflect, you know, probably, you know, more fear than of what might happen than what actually will happen. Mm. And these these regulatory issues aren't actually unique to China. I mean, we've seen Alphabet paying more than eight billion um, dollars in fines over the last 10 years by you know, being fined by the European Union, and that hasn't really impacted the performance that's had spectacular performance over the last decade. So um, it, it, it appears that people aren't necessarily taking cognizance of the fact that this has been happening in developed markets, and perhaps China is actually just playing catch up um, on the regulatory side. To, to laws and effect uh, to laws that have probably been in effect, um, you know, anti-monopoly laws in developed markets already in Western economies. Well, I think the Western economies. I mean, re regulatory action is, is is fluid. What happens today? You know, what is happening today? What happened yesterday doesn't dictate what's going to happen today. What's happened today doesn't suggest what might happen tomorrow. There's going to be, you know, probably more regulation. Or could be. I don't want to say problems. I just don't know. And so those are fears that that exist, or you know, that 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 will impact a an alphabet and, and or even Facebook that's in the portfolio, mm. you, know, you know, today. Which is why you know Facebook is is not a larger position. It wasn't before. We've always known that the regulatory concerns that 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 face a a that, that could face a Facebook or an, an alphabet, you know, are out there. You know, but again, you look you just tilt this to the Facebook discussion. Because that's in the news, you know, as far as the U.S. is concerned today, you know, given the whistleblower, you know, comments mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the Washington, you know, testimony. And, you know, those those fears existed before. We bought Facebook in the midst of fear in the Cambridge Analytica scandal, when we thought there might be, you know, uh, you know different, you know, regulatory, uh, we come under greater regulatory uh, scrutiny as, as time went on. And that's happening. I mean, but the question becomes, as we look down the road, you know, as long as they still have three and a half billion people on the planet, you know, using, you know, Facebook, and there's some double count in there, but still, it's a large number. As long as those people are using Facebook, find a need to use Facebook and its various and its various uh, products and services within, it, it's going to, you know, be, you know, it's going to perform fine over time. But again, over time, what happens over the short, you know, time frame is anybody's is anybody's guess. So we'll continue to lean into weakness as long as we believe there's nothing existential. So for us, the existential question of our Facebook is what hap what might happen or could happen to its its uh, user base. So we watch that very very closely. And if something comes around and the whole world goes to other products and 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 it becomes a a, a TikTok you know based world where everybody you know communicates through, I'm not, I'm saying this you know you know uh, with 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 great hyperbole you know just just to just you know, give an example but we're looking at any other platform that that could take the business from Facebook and that's what we watch and we were more concerned about that and what that might be than what the regulatory environment might might, might come to bear. Thanks very much. Thank you, Steve. I think we have time for one last question. You had um, you included Evergrande on one of your your uh, latest slides in in the presentation. What are the fears? I mean, some market commentators have likened this to to the collapse of Lehman back in the financial crisis, which then triggered you know the global financial crisis. What how how are you, how's FPA looking at what the potential contagion effects? of the Evergrande collapse might be across the China, Chinese economy as well as the global economy? 
I don't think the Evergrande example, you know, Lehman, I've never read that, and people have talked about Evergrande and Lehman, I think are very different because, because um, Lehman had, you know, offered the, uh, the counterparty risk that Evergrande doesn't. So the contagion that it comes from a Lehman was much more significant because of all the counterparty exposures and the companies that that were doing business, you know, with Lehman and the leverage that existed off balance sheet as well. In the case of Evergrande, look, I don't, I'm not suggesting the issues there are isolated, and I'm not suggesting there 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 isn't going to be broader issues across you know the Chinese landscape that couldn't you know be exported, you know, as well. But it's really the larger question is really more of the financial you know market, you know, there the uh, the the the, the uh, financial sector, I mean, and, and the leverage that exists there. There's far more leverage in, in China uh, than, you know, as a percentage of its GDP and within their financial system than we have here, for example, in the U.S. as a percentage of GDP. It's a, it's, it's, it's a huge number in the trillions. And how that unfolds is, is, a, is, a, is a very important question. We do not have exposure to these, you know, these kinds of uh, uh, heavily levered Chinese companies, certainly not the property companies. That's not the kind of businesses in which we invest, and what that might do to the Chinese market or the global markets is is anybody's is anybody's guess at this point. Thank you very much, Steve. I think that's all we have time for today. Really appreciate you being up so early to speak with us from LA, and thank you very much for those valuable insights and for delivering on your performance promises to your clients. Take care. Keep well. Thank you. And with that, we'll head back to the Ned Group Studio.